we've been studying over the past several weeks about the most powerful resource that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people that say, well, I just am not that interested in my concept of what church is because I see church as boring, I see church as powerless, I see church as people who are ineffective, they're not excited about anything, I see no power, no passion in anything in the church. Well, if you wanna put passion in your church, you probably ought to start at the basic level and get back to what's on the heart of God, and number one would be prayer. You see, there's no relationship without communication. Prayer is the ultimate communication tool with an almighty, eternal God. There is no substitute for it. There's no way to get around it. There's no way to say that you're a believer and not pray. A powerless Christian is a prayerless Christian. An ineffective believer in Jesus Christ, somebody who names the name Christian but has no power, there's no difference in their life, it's probably because the missing ingredient is prayer. You see, we've talked about this over the past several weeks, that if we enter into a marriage relationship, one of the key ingredients in a good marriage is that you communicate. And if you stopped communicating one day, you probably wouldn't have a marriage for very long. And of course, you've heard that, that little story about the couple that got married. I don't know if it was on Valentine's Day, but uh, they got married and on that day, he said, I love you and I do and all that stuff. And then later on, years down the line, she said, well, he never tells me that he loves me. And of course, the guy said, well, I told you on the day that we got married and if anything changes, I'll let you know. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bad answer. That'll get you in the doghouse really fast with your spouse if you say something like that because we all know that without communication and especially communicating your love for one another, there's not going to be a meaningful relationship. And if we don't enter into prayer in this most holy covenant that we have with God, where we come into his presence and he accepts us as his children. The Bible says we are the bride of Christ. If we never talk to the bridegroom, if we don't have relationship and communication with him, how can we say that we really have the relationship in the first place? So if you could turn in your Bible today, I wanna to touch on a passage of scripture that we also touched on last week, and I wanna follow up with this a little bit, and we're kind of building each week on some of the things that we've studied in previous weeks, but looking at different aspects of this subject of prayer, because we could explore this for a very, very long time. It's a vast subject from the word. God says a lot about it. Most of the dynamic men and women of faith in the scripture were people of prayer. They knew how to tap in to that power source. It's like a never ending power source that you don't have to pay for, you just connect. And wouldn't it be wonderful, you know we've talked about this as far as talking to God and the unlimited minutes on a cell phone plan and no roaming charges and all of that and you don't have to pay the bill, Jesus paid the price and all of that. In the same way, we also have unlimited power. It's not furnished by DPNL or AENS. It's furnished by the Most High God. It is an unlimited power source, and we can plug into it through prayer. But we have to plug in. We have to discipline ourselves to come to the well and drink. We have to tap into the power source. Um, some of you who've been around for a while remember that when I was growing up, we had um, a little lady from Kentucky who lived next door to us, and she was raising two sons. And um, 
she had all the modern conveniences in her house, but she liked to do things the old way. She was raised down in Kentucky on the farm and uh, she wanted to do things the old way. She washed her clothes outside in a wash tub and she would hang them on a line. And while she was out there hanging her clothes on the clothesline, she'd be singing, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can't make him drink. And I heard her singing it, and to this day, I can hear her voice. And the truth of what she was saying kind of comes to rest in this subject matter here. I can tell you all about prayer. I can tell you all about the truth of the word. But when it comes right down to it, I can lead you to the truth, but you've got to drink. It's up to you. It's a choice to do these things. You'll get power. You'll have the connection. You'll feel connected to the Most High God and it will change your life. It will transform your paradigm. But you have got to get in. You've got to get in. I can lead you there and that's what we're trying to do. And as we look at Ephesians chapter 6, I want to read for you a couple verses, and then we're going to go down to 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first verse that we're going to read right after this. But I want us to stand together when you've got that, Ephesians 6, verse 18 and 19, and then 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. And when you've got that, let's stand to our feet out of honor for the word of God. We've started doing this because we read in Nehemiah, that when Nehemiah and the walls were built of, of Jerusalem, Nehemiah was there, and Ezra the prophet read the scripture all day long, and they stood all day to hear the word of God and to reverence what was being said. So I thought, well, if they could stand all those hours, we can certainly stand for a couple minutes. Ephesians 6, verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all kinds of prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer. And there it, it means all kinds of prayer and supplication. Then down in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. And of course, once again, this is the Apostle Paul talking about prayer. Father, today we give you glory, and I pray that you will enlighten our hearts, open our spiritual eyes, that we may understand this resource just a little bit better. Thank you, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. You can be seated. So when each of you experienced physical birth into this life. You came into this world in an atmosphere. How many of you know what I'm talking about right now? You had to start breathing and there was an atmosphere that surrounded you. And it wasn't like the time was when you were in that womb swimming around. You had to breathe the air. And one of the things that the atmosphere does is it puts pressure on your lungs. And from the very beginning, you need to breathe. It's really important. The atmosphere all around puts pressure on your lungs and it makes you feel the need to have respiration and you need to breathe in air. The reason you breathe is because of all that air pressure that's exerted against your lungs which forces your lungs to take air in. It literally forces you to take the air in. If you want to live, you've got 
to breathe. That's in a physical body. Well, prayer is just like that. When you're born into the family of God, when you're born again, spiritually born, there's a transaction that happens, and it's not too dissimilar from a physical birth, but it's a a second birth. You become a child of God, and you enter into God's world, and there's a sphere in which you live then. The atmosphere of God's presence and his grace is all around you. It exerts pressure on your life. And the normal thing would be to breathe. And we just say, that's prayer. It's experiencing the atmosphere. It's the respiration that is necessary for us spiritually to continue spiritual life. Responding to God's pressure and his presence in your life. Prayer is as normal to the Christian as breathing is to a human body. At least it should be. Some of us have been stunted in our growth because we don't breathe much spiritually. We haven't really tapped in to what this spiritual resource is. You haven't tapped in to that, that power plant of, of life and, and absolute abundance that God gives until you tap into him. Prayer lines you up properly with God. And we're told to pray in the scripture in the spirit. To pray in that atmosphere where the Holy Spirit is in control and we're literally consumed by his presence. It's that exerting pressure and that force to have respiration. Prayer comes out of that. We remember the essential areas mentioned in 1 Timothy 2 that we just read. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving to God. They're all different types of prayer. We talked about it a little bit in our empowering prayer that happens at 10 a.m. here on Sunday mornings. I'll just tell you right now, if you want to get set free, if you want to get healed, if you want to get fired up, and maybe your wood's been a little wet, you need to get on fire here Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We're in here praying, and these were some of the things that we prayed about this morning. Supplication is asking God for his intervention in things in your life. Prayers, praying for others, praying for those who don't know God, praying for our nation, praying for our leadership, the ungodliness that's present in our society, praying against that, praying to bind the hands of the enemy, praying to unleash the power of the Holy Spirit, praying that God will take the blinders off of so many who are walking in blindness today, and ultimately giving thanks to God for everything he is and all that he has done. These are all areas of prayer, and we did it just this morning, and we ought to be doing it 24-7 just allowing that relationship to grow and develop, you'll become so comfortable with prayer that it'll be like riding around in a car with your best friend, only Jesus is in the seat next to you. And maybe for some of you, the way you drive, Jesus ought to take the wheel too. (laughs) But he's in the front seat with you. He's right there with you. And instead of your best friend and having conversation with your best friend, why not just talk to your best friend, Jesus? Speak out loud to him. Talk to him like he's the close friend that he really is. Just because he's spirit doesn't mean he's less there. He's there. And the scripture backs that up. And we pray and we enter into this this reciprocal communication kind of uh, sphere, which is just awesome. And I love this because the Holy Spirit gives us guidance for when to pray, what kind of prayer, kinds of prayer that would be needed as we face certain situations requiring an intervention of God. And I want to talk about this this morning because prayer and doing it one particular way, and maybe, you know, you've been bound up a little bit. You're, you're in a little bit of a of a traditional box 
where you haven't really sought the whole counsel of the word of God and you've heard, well, we, we ought to pray this certain way and you know, we need to be really pious and we need to be really sober and we have to be you know, just super, super quiet and you know, all of these things. And maybe you had verses drilled into you like I did as a kid, you know, the one, be still and know that I am God. You know, that is a great verse, by the way, out of the Psalms, but there are other verses. You know, shout joyfully to the Lord, clap your hands, you know, give an exclamation of praise, give a voice of triumph as God intervenes. But listen, you know, the Holy Spirit gives us guidance for what's needed. Every situation requires God's intervention and maybe on a different level than we've ever had to have before. So I want to look at just a, a few of these today. And if you've got something you can write with, this would be great to just take a few notes on. But since we've talked about this, I want to give you just a little more background and a little more biblical foundation for why we are encouraging certain things as we pray. And this is really important because, you know, it's, it's important that we pray in the spirit and the Bible says, Pray with understanding, to pray in, a, in an attitude where we get exactly what we're doing and that this is an exercise that's not just some sort of a pedantic, meaningless thing, but it has tremendous import. It's really, really important in our lives. This needs to be the resource that we grab above everything else. Before you go to a therapist, before you turn on a TV and a self-help you know, guru, before you go and, and try to start analyzing all the things in your past that make you the terrible person that you are and all of these things that you're told today, how about going to prayer and talking to the wonderful counselor? This is a resource that is awesome. Now, I'm not against counseling, so don't shoot me. Sindel's out of the room. <laughs> I'm not against counsel. I'm for counsel that encourages a biblical standard. And there is, there is no standard that should ever leave out the importance of prayer because this is the power source. This is the underpinning of everything that we need. So we can get answers from God, but I'll tell you, you will find out that there are huge answers as you're just in the presence of God. I just want to encourage you, get into the presence of God. You remember that, that old song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, the things of earth, the things that bug you, the things that trigger bad responses in you, all of those things that have a capacity to distract you and get you thinking about things that make you worry and fret and get upset. When you're in the presence of God, the things of earth grow strangely dim. You don't think about this stuff anymore because your priority structure is such that you say, God, you're everything. And you tell him about it. So number one, and you've heard me talk about this for several weeks now. Pray out loud. Pray out loud. This is a discipline that has not been talked about very much in our former group of churches called the Grace Brethren Churches. But I'll just tell you, it's not because of an absence of it being talked about in the Bible. There are certain things that we come to feel comfortable with and we need to discipline ourselves and retool ourselves so that we will get comfortable with, what, with what's on God's heart and not what we have just traditionally always done. 
and say, well, you know, I, I just am not comfortable with that because I've never done that. Well, of course. And that is a very human response. But the scripture says that praying out loud is something that is encouraged. In fact, it's really very, very much a command from scripture because there are moments when we need to pray out loud. And when I'm encouraging you to do that, I'm telling you to take a step outside your comfort zone. Do something that you haven't done. And I'm not telling you to do it because I think it's great. I'm telling you because the Bible says this is something we need to do. And as you recall, several weeks ago, we were in Isaiah 43, and God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Don't you see? Don't you see it springing up? I'm doing a new thing. And this might be the new thing that God's challenging you to take a step and do this year. Pray out loud. Go back on the old traditions. You know, if, if, we, if we've got meaningful traditions, we'll hold on to them. But if we find in the word as we're reading things that there's something more we could do to expand our relationship with the Lord, to have more effective prayer, to see God do more things. Listen, when we pray out loud, we're talking about doing something that produces unity. As those around us are hearing us pray out loud and they're hearing the desire and the passion of our hearts and they're hearing things that are important to us and they get in agreement with us, there's unity that's built. We all get on the same page. Joe Daniel would start praying and I would hear what she's saying and as I'm praying, I'm hearing what she's praying and I start to pray in agreement with her. Yeah. And the Bible says where two or three agree together as touching anything that they'll ask, it shall be done of the Father. So agreement is one of the byproducts of praying out loud. The other thing, it's, it's conversational. And like I was talking about, when God is riding along with you in the car, talk to him. You sing with the radio, you sing in the shower, you do all kinds of other things that probably are pretty goofy, and kind of out there. I mean, why not talk to Jesus? That's real. Talk to him. Let him hear from you. Talk to him about some of the other drivers that are cutting you off and you know some of the crazy people that are driving around you. Ask him to protect you from those people you know, who are on some substance out there driving. You know, we've got a resource in having him close to us. And it just builds our capacity to stay in communication with him. I'll tell you right now, it will change your whole paradigm. Your whole atmosphere will shift as you do this. Because you know, as you're speaking to him, you're backing up the fact that he's present and by faith, you're saying, I believe that, and you're talking to him. What a great thing. Psalm 142, verse one. This is the prayer of the warrior king, King David. He said, with my voice, I do what? I cry out to the Lord. With my voice. Now he's not saying here that he prays silently. I'm sure he does. And we read about some of those things in the other part of Psalms and as David gives his testimony other places but he says there are situations where with my voice out loud crying out loud I plead for mercy to the Lord he's praying he's talking to the Lord and he is doing it out loud even crying out to the Lord in Matthew 18 Jesus said in verse 19, again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So he's telling us to get in agreement, and the only way we can do that is if we do it out loud because none of us are mind readers. Right? You might be praying something silently. I don't know what you're praying. <laughs> if you pray out loud, we can get in agreement. And see... That's awesome. 
So Jesus said, get in agreement. Well, it necessitates then that you pray out loud. And that's why Jesus was teaching this. And we know that this was a component in the early church. Acts chapter one, verse 14. They were all in one accord. They were all together in unity. And what were they doing? Devoting themselves to prayer. Well, how could they be in unity? How could they be in agreement? How could they be in one accord if they were not praying out loud? And here, Acts chapter one, verse 14 says that they were all, all of them, the disciples, The women who hung out with the disciples, the mother of Jesus, they were all there. They were in one accord, praying out loud together and devoting themselves to prayer. And it says, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all of his brothers, the disciples. Agreement, conversation, praying out loud. There is power in this form of prayer. And it's talked about then another time in Hebrews chapter five, verse seven. And this is talking about Jesus himself and what it was like for him to pray during the time of his earthly ministry. How did he pray? What did he do? And it says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication. Next words. With loud cries. Hmm. And tears. To him, that would be God, who was able to save him from death. And he was heard. How could he be praying out loud? Well, he was, because if he, if he wasn't, it wouldn't say he was heard. The father heard him, and his prayers were heard, because there were loud cries and tears. So what would Jesus do? He would pray out loud. And that's what he did during his earthly ministry. And you might say, well, pastor, I just, I just don't know if I could do that. Well, yep, you might have to try something new. And it won't kill you. You'll grow. And sometimes you need to just cry out to the Lord and just say, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, be, be in this situation I need you. I trust you. Say it out loud so that it means something to you. Your ears are hearing what you're saying. And by faith, you are growing because faith comes by hearing. Yes. So how can you hear unless something is being said? So we pray out loud for a number of reasons, but listen, it's for unity, it's for conversation, it's for agreement together, and certainly it is to build us up in our faith. Look, when you've had a conversation with somebody, you talk out loud. Why not do it with God? You pause, you listen to the other person, then that repeats over and over as you two continue your dialogue And what we're talking about here is modeling your prayer in this way to grow your faith. Make it a dialogue with God. Have input into him. Let him have input into you. And it's gonna reinforce the fact that you're speaking with a God who loves to hear from you. And let me just tell you the miraculous thing It's about the Holy Spirit. He takes our imperfect petitions and prays and makes them perfect before God the Father. And if you want to know what the biblical backing for that is, it would be Romans 8. None of us can pray perfectly. And we don't do it for the purpose of being heard. It's just to increase our maturity spiritually, to increase our faith, to let God hear from us to let him know the level of belief and trust and conversation that we want to have with him. He is the most high God. And you get to talk to him. How awesome is that? Let's take advantage of it. Let's do it. Let's participate in this. Or 
You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You got to do it. You've got to be the one that steps out. Praying out loud will also stretch you outside your comfort zone. And, and listen, it also shows you how vulnerable you are. You know, vulnerability. I might say the wrong thing. We shouldn't shy away from praying out loud just because we feel vulnerable, just because we're uncomfortable. Hey, it's biblical. Let's do it. So do we believe what the sign says out here? The church's motto, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. Well, if we believe the Bible, we will pray out loud. So I know you probably haven't heard that before at first grace, but I'm just telling you what the word says. <laughs> I love talking in these terms because if you've got a problem with stuff, you can't get on my back. You'll have to fight it out with God. Number two is a prayer of devotion. Maybe while you're having your prayer of devotion, you can fight it out with God. Tell him you only want to talk to him real quietly. Prayer of devotion. And there's room for this. There are all kinds of ways to touch heaven, to get in the presence of God. And number two is a prayer of devotion. And when I'm talking about a prayer of devotion, I'm talking about a secret quiet prayer. And yeah, that's talked about too. There are times when we need the kind of prayer that prays it out loud. That we're in a dynamic, conversational mode with God, praying out loud. Then there are times when we have experienced brokenness, when maybe words fail us, and don't seize on these things and say, yeah, but pastor, that's me all the time. There, there might be moments when we need to just have a devotional, we call it a quiet time, a devotional secret place where we go to God. It's just us. There are no distractions. There's a peace. There is a contemplation that's important. And of course, Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, and we've been talking about the Lord's prayer. He said, when you pray, not if, not at some moment when you decide to, but he says, when you pray, because this is an expectation that you will be doing it continually, praying without ceasing, praying without stopping, continually in a mode of touching heaven. He says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Quiet times with him. We need these too. There are some moments, and gratefully, we've got 24 seven. We got all the minutes in a day. We have all the seconds in every minute. We have all the hours in every day. There's plenty of time to pray out loud. There's plenty of time to pray in secret. Anytime you need to converse with God, there is a way to do it. And there is a biblical way to do it and to really press in for maximum effectiveness. So when he sees that you're ready to spend quality, quiet time with him, I believe that that really delights his heart as well. Jesus did this. And it's not about doing it for anybody's enjoyment except God's. And Jesus said the disciples need to pray thinking about this model because they had seen so many abuses of prayer out loud. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the people who got up in front of the people and they prayed these lofty theological prayers that probably didn't get as far as the ceiling of the building that they were in. Because it was all for show. It was all just a big demonstration of how pious and full of themselves the Pharisees were. And God said, I'm not interested in that. 
Don't come to me with, with a bunch of platitudes. I don't need a bunch of prepared lines or anything. I'm talking about relationship and not religion. And here we underscore this again. Because this is something that I have drummed and drummed and drummed and drummed. We're not religious here. We are relational. We have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as a result of accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And as far as prayer, it follows the same guidelines. It's not about religion and what you go through. It's about relational communication where you're just saying 24-7, God, you are amazing. I love you. And if we don't believe that, why do we sing those songs like, and he walks with me and he talks with me? What do you think that's talking about? Prayer. It's prayer. Relationship and conversation with the one who loves us so much. Mark 1.35 talks about how Jesus handled it. And it says, Mark 1.35, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. You see, so there are some moments when you need to lift your voice like King David did and you need to pray out loud and just be vocal with the Lord about things that are on your heart and you need to just speak those things out. Get them out. Say them. Then there are other times you need to be alone with the Lord. You need some serious time away from distraction, away from stress, away from other responsibilities, and just value your time with him. And I bet that there are some moments like that when Dave and Brandon are out in the field and their intent is to go out there and shoot a deer. But there are lots and lots of moments when you're just in complete solitude. It's a perfect time to say, Lord, I love you. And by the way, bring me a 12 point buck right now. I just need it. Let the Lord know that you're desperate for him. Moments of silence, moments of sweet, quiet, secret moment with him. Romans 8, 26 says that sometimes we don't know what to pray. And these are the moments when we get quiet sometimes. And it says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. And a lot of times this is a quandary. You know, you come into the presence of God and you know you need to be talking to him. And, you know, you just say, well, Lord, I'm, I'm just not sure how to express to you what I'm feeling right now. Just don't know how to tell you, you know, how downright awful this week has been or how hard it was, you know, when this person did this to me or when I faced this thing that made me feel so upset and kind of alone. And you just go to the Lord and you, and you just say, Lord, I'm not sure how to pray. And right here it says that the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, that part of the Trinity, that part of the Godhead that is there inside you as you've received Jesus, he intercedes for you with groanings too deep for words. He prays for you. Now that doesn't mean that you disengage I mean, you just hold on to him and just let him talk. Get in agreement with what the Spirit's saying. And in those moments, a lot of times, because you're so intertwined spiritually with the Holy Spirit, as he begins to pray for you, you just get in agreement with what God's saying. And you just hold on to that, and you get the victory as the Holy Spirit prays for you. Now, that is a cool concept. And this is a resource that God gives to us. There is no pit so deep, Corey Tamboom said. I remember quoting this just within the last couple of weeks. 
There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And knowing that she went through the Holocaust, the concentration camp life, and just barely escaped by a clerical error, we know that secret prayer, quiet prayer, works. Silence allows a connection to God beyond what words can express. And I don't want you to get so consumed with one kind of praying that it becomes this overarching thing because we need to pray in an abundance of different ways because there are different needs. And we pray in the spirit and with understanding. So understanding is what the spirit gives us about what's necessary. So the medicine is different for every situation that comes up. You don't prescribe one kind of medicine for every situation. God says, I will guide you. There are times when you need to be guided into lifting up your voice and praying out loud. There are other times you need to just get before God and be quiet. Get into a secret place and let it be devotional. Get away from life as usual and spend time in silence and solitude. Ask God to help you express your need for him through a simple prayer. And maybe in these moments you could choose a physical position that will enable you to stay alert. A lot of times people in the quietness of their own home or their prayer closet, they'll kneel down, maybe lay on the ground before God and just take a position of total submission. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And as we look at these two things, you, you think, well, those two ways of praying, you know, th those are so different. But there's a need for us to press in in both of these ways at times. The third kind of prayer that is absolutely essential and it is so biblical is a prayer of confession and faith. The prayer of faith is talked about in the scripture. A prayer of confession is talked about in the scripture. And they really are hand in glove, closely tied, prayers of confession, prayers of faith. And what we're talking about here are prayers that we bring before the Lord that gain us the perspective that we could never ever have without that prayer of confession or faith. And I'm talking about somebody who does not know the Lord, is an unbeliever, maybe has been a pagan their whole life. They have not been aware of spiritual things. They do not walk with the, with the Lord. No relationship with Jesus Christ. And the one prayer that God wants to hear from them would be a prayer of confession. Because that's what brings us into a place where we meet God. It's really important. If you remember, and I'm gonna skip down a little quicker into a couple of these passages here. Matthew 14, 30 was one of these kinds of prayers that God wants to hear from an unbeliever. In this situation, Peter was a believer, but he needed to utter kind of a quick confession in a situation where he needed rescue. And this is in Matthew 14 and 30. And you remember the story. The disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee. The winds came up. The waves were coming over the boat. They were in danger of losing their lives. And suddenly they see in the distance a figure coming on the water. As he got closer, it was Jesus walking on the water. And as he got closer to the boat, Peter said, Jesus, call so I can come out to you. And he desired to stretch his faith and be able to walk on the water with Jesus. He wanted to be involved in the miracle power that he saw that Jesus was exerting. Well, he got out there and to make a long story short, he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the storm and immediately started to sink. But until that time, 
he was walking on water. Looking at Jesus, believing, and walking on water. Suddenly, he got aware of the distractions around the storm, the waves, all the danger that he thought of, and suddenly he began to sink. His prayer of confession in Matthew 14, 30 was, Lord, save me. Three words. Prayer of confession. He spoke them to Jesus. And suddenly, the hand stretched down. And Jesus picked him up. In essence, this is what happens when we come into relationship with Jesus. When we receive salvation, and salvation is just the big word for save. Jesus saves. He brings salvation. Jesus saved Peter. And in the same way, he came and he rescued you. He reached down and he said, you know what? You're living in a stormy life. You need rescue. You might have been going down for the third time and you couldn't breathe anymore. And Jesus reached down. And all you had to say was, Lord, save me. And he'd pick you up. There are a lot of people today, and you might say, well, that's easy believism. There's, there's a lot more to it. But listen, that is a beginning prayer. It's a prayer of confession. It's a prayer of faith that God can do it, and you're trusting him to do it. And we realize in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Even if the prayer is just, Lord, save me, that prayer has power. That's awesome. Somebody ought to say an amen right there. Thank you. I love to coach you. You know, you can lead a horse to water. There it is. The heart believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So when Peter said, Lord, save me, it was a prayer of confession. This is the prayer that God wants to hear from each one of us. Today, if you've not said that, if you haven't expressed that to God, if you haven't asked for the salvation of the Lord, if you haven't asked for this relationship to come into your life, this prayer is what God wants to hear from you. Also, confession of sin, repentance, a prayer of repentance is also really important. And we were talking about this this morning as we were going down through the Lord's Prayer in our power time of prayer. We said, Matthew 6, 12, and 13, forgive us our debts, Lord, as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we're asking God to deliver us, to forgive us, to save us. These are prayers of confession and faith, and this is the one that really, really puts the emphasis where it needs to be because nothing else will be possible until we humble ourselves and pray. So you remember 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, if my people who are called by my name will first humble themselves. Now, this is hard. None of us want to be humbled. That is humanity. That is, and I'm speaking from experience. None of us naturally want to humble ourselves. We would like to carry out our own agenda and we would like to get things done our way. But God says, if you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have to humble yourself to accept what he wants over what you want. And this is essential in prayer. If we go in with a kind of a wish list and we're, we're looking at God as some sort of a cosmic Santa who grants wishes, we're not going to get what we need. 
we humble ourselves and we say, God, I want what you want and I know it's all good. I know it's all loving. I know it's all exactly what's needed. I trust you, your will be done. And the, the beautiful picture here is a parent who knows exactly what his child needs. So I had my grandkids over this week. And Grammy and Grampy knew exactly what they needed. They needed homemade pizza and s'mores over the fire. And, you know, it was, a, it was a really fun treat. And it was really sweet. And, of course, you know, we ask the parents before we feed these things to the kids. But when they came over and they wanted to, you know, sit in my lap and they wanted to be in, in our home and they wanted to be having our presence around and, and just spending time with us. I wanted to do things that were loving and I wanted to give them things that would just be a blessing to them. So I was the one who thought of s'mores and who would have ever thought in the middle of February you could do a fire outside and cook s'mores over the fire. And it was such an awesome privilege. And I thought to myself, you know, this was, this was unique and it was special. And they knew that I love them and they could come into my presence and I would have great ideas of things that they would enjoy. They would, they would be blessed by time with us. So Damascus was also there, Brooks' little boy. And he saw that there was candy on the table and I keep sugar-free candy around, and so I don't really have to ask a lot of the parents because I know that it's not bad for them. But he wanted to have one of those hard pieces of candy. And so his parents have been really, really skittish about him sucking on those things and maybe potentially choking. And so I said, well, I'm going to have you put this in your pocket, and if you can wait and take it home and ask your mama... When she says it's okay, then you could have it. So this is an exercise in really being patient and learning that there are some things that you can't just go ahead and jump into and do. Mommy knows. So the grandfather wanted him to have it, but I knew he probably would have to wait to get the final word. You know, there are so many parallels here as we look at a relationship with our heavenly loving father and what we need to be patient on as we're praying. He knows what we need. He knows the timing. We know he's got good things. He wants to bless us. He wants to make us feel loved. He wants to give us the very best things. But sometimes there's a process that has to play out. Grandparents know just a little bit more than parents do. But I know that those children need to hear from their parent. And even though I know some things, I would never try to step over my kids and their decisions for their own children. And why is that? It's because a loving daddy, a loving mommy, knows what's best for their child. And can I just insert here just another little thing having to do with our current society? The state doesn't know what's best for your children. Parents do. The government does not know what's best for your children or your grandchildren. The family knows. And, you know, there, there might have been people who thought that it takes a village to raise children. It also takes a family. And there are a lot of substitutes out there, and the government would love to step in and take the role of parents. But listen, we see this picture. As we come to God in prayer, he wants to have a relationship with us. He knows what's best for you. He's your loving heavenly daddy. 
as we come to him, James 5.16 says, therefore confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, and you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. So we see that there's healing available. There's spiritual healing available. There's salvation available. There's restoration available. All of these things are available through the resource of prayer. And then we have these ter terrific forms of prayer that we can use and it just, they're, they're there for us to build us. So what's prayer supposed to be about? Well, first of all, it's the kind of prayer. And as we talked about this this morning, I want you to just focus on the different kinds of prayer. These are all uses of prayer for specific things that the Spirit guides you into. Ephesians 6.18, as we quoted it right up front, says all kinds of prayer, all kinds of prayer, any old kind. Standing up, sitting down, crying out, whispering, praying in a closet, praying in public, supplication, bringing your needs to the Lord, interceding, which is praying for somebody else's needs, thanksgiving, which is thanking God for what he's done, praising God, which is just extolling his virtues, any kind of prayer, all kinds of prayer. The Bible says just do it. Pray all the time. All right then, lastly, there are some hindrances to prayer. And I'm gonna close with this. Generally speaking, I've been on the positive side of prayer, that you've got it as a resource, you can use it at any time. You're uniquely gifted in relationship with God to take it on, to do everything that you need to. But there is one hindrance, and Psalm 66, 18 says it. If I regard sin in my heart, if I harbor sin in my heart, it says the Lord will not hear me. This is the one thing that we've got to keep in check. If we want to make sure that there is not going to be any hindrance to tapping into that power supply, Okay, so you know you, you want to make sure that your fuses are in good shape and you want to make sure that there's not going to be anything that's going to, going to really, really hinder and really cut you off from that power supply. The one thing spiritually that could cut you off in your prayer life would be harboring sin in your heart. If I regard iniquity in my heart, Knowing that there's sin, unforgiven, unconfessed, unrepented of sin in your heart. And generally speaking, the big hindrance of sin is usually selfishness. It's pride. It's not being willing to lay down your stuff and confess it and repent of it so that you can really go on to the next level. But this is really clear in Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So the hindrance to prayer would be sin. And I don't want to go into the multiplicities of sin. You know, we don't need to focus on that, but we just need to know that if there's sin in our lives, if there's anything at all that has captivated us or put us in a place where we're regarding that and keeping that little corner and we think, well, you know, I've got this little pet thing that I'm going to hang on to. This is one thing that I'm just not going to, I'm not going to let go of. And you know it's wrong. And as we've read in James before, to the one that knows to do right and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. And if we harbor that in our lives, the Bible says the Lord will not hear our prayer. I'd like to have some clear vessels here that will pray in power. But if there's sin, that will be a hindrance. So you might say, Pastor, what do I do about that? Well, confess it right here and right now. If it's bitterness, if it's pride, if it's selfishness, if it's some sort of backbiting, gossip, lack of unity, 
dissension. I, I don't know what it might be. You might be involved in all kinds of other things. But listen, if sin has gotten the better of you and you've got it in your heart, you know it's there. The Bible says, don't expect to have a victorious prayer life. God wants to hear that little prayer like he heard from Peter from you. Lord, save me. 